Gracias. Bueno, gracias por la introducción y, um, y me gustaría expresar mis uh, agradecimientos a Dr. Víctor Gallardo por la invitación aquí hoy y a Jesse Osabel y a la Fundación Sloan y todos los grupos que son participantes en el Census uh, de Vida Marino. Y actualmente voy a hablar en, uh, en inglés. Es un poco más fácil y tengo mucha información que gustaría, que gustaría compartir con ustedes, entonces voy a cambiar. Y si tienen preguntas, estoy listo, si disponible, res, responder a los. Y después de mi charla, charla o oh, esta noche. Gracias. Bueno, I am, my name is George Schillinger. Uh, I'm with Stanford University, the Center for Ocean Solutions, and I've been a uh, participant in the uh, tagging of Pacific Pelagic's program for, for many years, almost since its inception. Um, I'm going to provide today, a, a just a, present my outline here, a quick background on the top program and describe some of the work we've done in the North Pacific, our synthesis efforts, hot spots, and ocean observations, and then uh, provide you with a case study on, my, on the, the species that I actually focused on, which is the leatherback turtle, and talk a bit about how our tracking efforts revealed um, observations about the influence of ocean currents on leatherback distribution and movements and implications for conservation and then I'll give a, a quick wrap-up and describe next steps and I just want to say uh, um, up front that there are that the top program is a huge collaboration involving many uh, universities and researchers from all over the world so the data I'm presenting today is is data that's been uh, created by a lot of different uh, researchers uh, from many different uh, places So, first, when we just to sort of step back, when we look at the ocean what, from space, what we see is a, is a or we, when we look at planet Earth, we, we see a blue planet and um, a, a vast sort of featureless realm of blue that's not that much different from, from, you know, from what we see from uh, the deck of a boat or from a beach. Uh, a vast expanse of blue. And um, it's only with the advent of new technologies uh, that we're really beginning to understand uh, what, what, what's happening. Um, under this uh, under this layer, and for many of us, um, when we think about uh, for predators and prey, one of the images that comes to mind uh, is uh, the African savanna, and we all know from television and media and and maybe our, our terrestrial heritage that um, where where there's water, there's food, there are predators, and uh, lions eat zebras. But um, when we think about the ocean we have a more challenging um, perspective because it's really difficult to, to understand what's happening um, in the sea. So, the, and, and predators present, ocean predators present a lot of challenges. Um, it's difficult to, to study uh, ocean predators. You've got to catch them, you've got to handle them, you've got to find them. And so this is all relatively a uh, new, new field. And what we use to unravel these mysteries are electronic tagging technologies, and what you see here are several different uh, types of tags. A pop-up tag, uh, a spot satellite position tag, here's a pop-up tag on a tuna, a, a, a satellite relay data logger, a GPS tag, and we use different animals as platforms for uh, the, 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 the research effort. And to do this, we had to really understand a bit about the behavior of these species and uh, the, the, their ability to, to, to carry different types of tags and to know what kind of data we were actually seeking. So a lot of this required innovations and collaborations with uh, tag manufacturers and engineers and oceanographers and numerical modelers. But, um, and and then along the way, we, we made some great innovations, um, retrofitting tags that were originally designed for elephant seals and sea lions to, for use on turtles and sharks. And this uh, type of effort comes with a lot of challenges, uh, attaching tags to fast-moving animals. And this is a, a shot by Bruce Mate, who uh, did a lot of the cetacean work with the uh, Census of Marine Life. And um, how, to, how to catch, as I mentioned before, and tag things that are really toothy, uh, that are aggressive and, and, uh, and strong and, and, and tough to, to work with, uh, like these mako sharks. So we set out with a series of objectives uh, focused on developing technologies for tagging. Um, integrating different disciplines, marine ecology, physical oceanography, engineering, and many others, uh, elucidating animal behavior at the scale of the environment, trying to use uh, animals as, as ocean sensors to enhance our ocean observation efforts, 
and then ultimately to take this data and apply it to conservation and management. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here except to say that the, the structure of TOP was relatively complex, involved a lot of coordination, a lot of different working groups. Um, this is an interesting issue. Should this program be expanded to other places of the world, um, it could take on different forms, but what we used in, in, uh, in the North Pacific was an or organismal working groups, oceanographic integration groups, data management teams, and an education and outreach component. And we also worked with various, with, with NOAA and, and other um, institutions to figure out ways to put, serve up this, the, the tracking information live and integrate it with oceanographic data. And you can find this online at the Tagging Pacific Glagix website. And what you see here are a lot of tracks of different animals and sea surface temperature, chlorophyll, and other oceanographic variables are served up alongside them. So this is a summary of all of the positions in the top data set. This data here is soon to be uh, published actually in nature and what we're, um, what you see are aggregations of different taxol, like the tracks of different, three different species of tuna, elephant seals and sea lions, three different species of sharks, several different species of birds, loggerheads and leatherbacks, and whales. And um, color-coded there so you get, you, get, you get a better sense um, of what's happening. And then just in, to quickly summarize those, the colors up here describe the different species. And what we saw as an overview is extensive ocean coverage, entire basin coverage, niche separation among species, two distinct populations of sea turtles, three different species of tuna with seasonal overlap in trans-Pacific migrations, including migrations like these bluefin here. And um, that seabirds covered vast amounts of ocean space uh, in relatively short periods. So over the course of it, the last decade, we, did, we deployed uh, tags on 23 species, over 4,300 tags, collected more than a million profiles, and, uh, have, uh, and are at 335,000 plus tracking, total tracking days. And the data we've derived from this work has been position data, species identification, temperature, light, pressure, salinity, salinity fluorescence, and time series data, among others. And uh, we've had great success using elephant seals as gliders. This is an image by Dan Costo, many of you may be familiar with, who's worked in the Southern Ocean for many years. And this shows temperature slices taken by elephant seals tagged on in the California current. And we also um, have, are able to capture conductivity information from elephant seals as well with CTD tags from which we can derive salinity and examine variability in the density structure of the upper ocean and, and temp at high spatial and, and temporal resolutions and understand where masses of, of water are. Um, and then what we, we came to the, basically elephant seals sort of emerged as the sort of imminent uh, oceanographer in our animal uh, tracking data set. Uh, you, you, you release what you see here is a track uh, from a turtle tagged off, San uh, sorry, an elephant seal tagged off Santa Cruz. And over six months, it basically uh, went deep into the uh, North Pacific, collected over 10,000 um, uh, profiles. And you can see here uh, a six month window of, from a, a, an elephant seal's eye view of the ocean as, as the seal moved um, along this track. And um, what we what we learned with elephant seals is that they're prolific divers. They give they give their they show great uh, track fidelity. They go back and forth uh, from foraging habitats to to in, and back into the California current system, and they segregate uh, as well. So we have females going out uh, into heading out into the transition zone and up into the Bering Sea, and males heading north along the California current system. And seabirds were great uh, monitors, or ocean sentinels for us as well. As I mentioned before, they covered a tremendous amount of terrain and took a lot of samples, as, as did tuna. And this is a, a, a tuna track that spanned over 600 days, uh, tagged off of Baja that crossed the Pacific and came back again. Um, so what we've begun to discern then is how closely related species use the ocean differently um, in space. And what you see here, our frequency of observations um, on the on the y-axis and sea surface temperature on the x-axis for laysan and black-footed albatross that are St. Patrick breeding birds tagged in the northwestern Ho uh, Hawaiian Islands, and they showed a partitioning out for um, in, in, for, in foraging during the non-breeding period um, for, in seeking ocean resources. So we'd see black-footed 
uh, albatross is heading into the California current system, and lace on albatross is heading into the transition zone. And similarly, we also would, saw some niche separation with, uh, with bluefin and yellowfin tuna. And here you see bluefin tracks in blue, yellowfin in red, but there's also a lot of overlap in the southern part of the California current off Baja, where we were tagging both species and albacore at the same time. And with sharks, uh, over here we have um, salmon sharks, which would make large migrations from, their, from where they're tagged in Alaska, down the California current, out towards Hawaii, from moving from north to south and back again. And uh, white sharks and these black tracks heading out towards the Hawaiian Islands and out into the Central Pacific into an area which we call the White Shark Cafe. They seem to spend a lot of time here. We're not exactly sure what they're doing. They're, um, and that's a, a mystery that we're working on resolving now, and then mako sharks as well, who's, who uh, all three species overlapped, but they also showed very distinct temperature preferences. Um, and we also were able to examine the correlations between various environmental variables and movements and see that uh, during, during specific periods, you'd find all species together, and then they would separate. Um, and so from this data, we're starting to ascertain the presence of ocean hotspots and also examining regions of higher biodiversity. And we found that uh, this Southern California Bight and the, the California Current region that sp sort of spans up towards the, in, in, into, um, into the, Oregon, up the Oregon coast, and with some key areas being the Gulf of Farallons here, uh, the, the California Bight, and also, actually Baja has, has shown up, the Baja Peninsula as an important region as well, are, are um, important sites for both biodiversity and aggregation. Um, so some, some synth preliminary synthesis conclusions. We've seen basin scale migrations of top predators. I've pointed out several of these to you um, previously. We've seen habitat overlap and niche partitioning among different species. This is the example of the albatross here and the sharks here. And we've identified um, key habitats as well, including these uh, transitions, this transition zone region, these eddies that are propagated off the Gulf of Alaska, which are frequented by uh, elephant seals, uh, the California current system, and the white shark uh, cafe. All of these areas have shown up as quite important. And um, what's, what's also been um, particularly useful for us from a tracking point of view, but also interesting from a biological point of view, are these repeat, is the track fidelity we've seen uh, to both to migration pathways and to um, back and forth from breeding areas to foraging habitats. Um, and here you see e seals, and then up here, and you know, these different colors represent some of the different species I've mentioned uh, previously. So now to quickly move to leatherback turtles. Um, there are two different stocks in the Pacific. There's a Western Pacific stock and an Eastern Pacific stock. Our tracking data showed that there's very little mixing. Um, this, the status of leatherbacks in the Pacific is quite dire. As many, as many of you probably know, they've experienced over 90% declines during the last 20 years. Uh, our hope is that by understanding where they go and what drives their change and affects their behavior, we'll be able to figure out better strategies for protecting them. We used uh, satellite relay data loggers produced by the Sea Mammal Research Unit. This is the nesting beach where we did the tracking work. We did four, uh, three different seasons of, of tracking here. This is basically the last um, sort of, uh, this is the highest, the last remaining high density nesting colony for uh, leatherbacks in the Eastern Pacific. And this is off Northwestern Costa Rica. It's called Playa Grande. And um, numbers there have declined, uh, nesting turtles have declined precipitously. This is our tracking data set over three different years. 2007 uh, is in green, 2005 in purple, and 2004 in orange. And as you can see, there was extensive movement into the South Pacific gyre with some movement into the uh, EZ of Chile. And there are, of course, um, reports of interactions with fisheries in Chile and waters as well. And quickly, just in addition, the, the great bonus from this work was that not only did we learn about the, the large-scale oceanic movements, but we saw uh, we had a great opportunity due to the turtles in our nesting behavior to learn about what they're doing within the economic zone of Costa Rica and around the national park. And this is where they're protected, where they, where they breed. But over the three months of inter nesting, turtles move extensively into unprotected waters where they're at risk from all sorts of pressure. So um, currently, we're working with the government of Costa Rica now to figure out ways to apply this data to improved uh, zoning. We also f discovered 
elucidated the presence of a migration corridor for leatherbacks, which had been posited by uh, Moriali et al. in 1996 in Nature, and uh, he had attributed a number of different potential variables that might um, influence the, the creation of this corridor. Uh, we uh, are in, in analyzing zonal currents, and there are several strong zonal currents that run through this equatorial region. Um, we were able to determine that turtles actually increased their movements as they moved uh, off the nesting beaches through the zonal current system. And I won't go through each of these phases, but basically we um, found a persistent migration corridor which was published in PLS Biology and was subsequently um, created, uh, used to uh, create an IUCN resolution. Uh, although it's just a resolution, um, it has some merits to um, work to protect uh, turtles and mitigate fisheries interactions on the high seas. We stripped away the current effects and found that there was a directed southward migration. And um, we found that, that uh, turtles really had two phases of migration, one um, in uh, rapid movements through the, the, uh, the equatorial zonal current system and then slowing down into uh, this oceanographic, what we call an oceanographic cold spot in the central of the south central South Pacific gyre where you have an otherwise totally oligotrophic quiescent region which makes us wonder what turtles are doing there. We know they're foraging but uh, it remains a mystery um, specifically what they're, what, what they're, where they're, what food they're, um, or what they're, what exactly they're doing there. You, you would expect uh, that turtles would be associating with more productive regions along these shelf habitats but instead they're going out into relatively unproductive open ocean areas. So that's a mystery we're working on as well. And uh, finally, we were able to take this data and uh, all, for all the work we're doing at sea and around the nesting beach, the leatherback situation is still dire and turn it into a great communications uh, exercise uh, called the Great Turtle Race in 2007, which um, we found sponsors and drummed up a lot of interest in sea turtle conservation and I won't, uh, I think time is too tight to show you the race, but um, we're able to attract tremendous international attention to the cause of leatherbacks uh, conservation. So finally, just in summation, um, I'm going to go quickly through this. Uh, I, I believe what, what we've uh, created is a great opportunity to use uh, animals as ocean sensors and sentinels, and that here uh, at this meeting in particular, I just wanted to um, maybe put forth the, the idea that something like this could be carried could, could be uh, carried on on a grander scale in the South Pacific, and we've heard in many talks how important this region is, and how um, how critical it is to have ongoing monitoring programs and and integrate them. So, as part of this effort, it's conceivable that these th this type of a project could be linked with the Tichado Ocean Obser obs Observation System and tied to other marine life observing networks and ocean obser observing systems. And uh, here's where we are today. If you want to visit the GTOP website, and I want to thank all of these sponsors and supporters who've made this project possible. And um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, George. Uh, if there is any question, Jesse. George, which are some of the first species that you would like to observe if you were to uh, begin a program of tagging, uh, an enhanced program of tagging here uh, in Chile? I think uh, leatherbacks, swordfish, um, I would uh, look at some of the seal populations as well. Um, and. Uh, Probably, you know, what, what's, what's, what's really nice is that the California current work is a great corollary for the Humboldt current system, so you could use a lot of, the, a lot of very similar species um, here, in fact, you know, the same species in many cases, but get a better sense for uh, their distributions and movements in the South Pacific. But for sure, I think, for me personally, uh, the interaction between leatherbacks and swordfish is a fascinating one, both here and in, in uh, the California current system, where we have lots of issues with, uh, with drift gill netting efforts and and um, clo possible closures and management of, of uh, high seas habitats. And whales, of course, would be a great target as well. So seals, whales, and turtles, and swordfish. George, I, ha I have a question. I think in Chile uh, we will be happy to, to apply this uh, technology to Jack Mackerel, to the Chilean Jack Mackerel. 
I, I see that most of the populations that you use are small populations. The jack mackerel is very abundant, at least in, in relatively compared to the, the species that you use. Could the technology be used to follow the migration patterns of uh, jack mackerel? Yes. This is a big problem right now in Chile. It's a big social problem. The government uh, approved uh, large quotas for this year, I think 1,300,000 tons. The industrialists prepared for that kind of catch, but they were not able to catch more than 300,000. So there's a lot of people being fired, a lot of boats are, are standing. And so to, to predict this kind of thing in the future, I think it would be very important. And everybody says that there's only one population, but perhaps this Populations have different behaviors, like the, the ones of the tuna, for example, from the Gulf of Mexico and the Mediterranean. So these technologies will be very important to apply here very soon. It's urgent. I, I, uh, I, I agree, and I actually saw the article, a front page article in the paper this weekend on Jack Mackerel on this very issue, on, or I guess it was Monday. And my, my thinking on that is that um, through a collaboration with Post and OTN, we one idea, and this is something that obviously is years, is years out, but uh, that it, it could be developed or the positioning of arrays along the coast of Chile, much as, uh, as we're at, as along the lines of what uh, Ron presented earlier in some of these other talks. And, um, and so we could do a small acoustic tagging on Jack Mackerel, and eventually I think the tagging technologies are going to be sophisticated enough and the miniaturization will progress enough that we could put uh, pop-up tags as well on much, on much smaller fish. So it would be really interesting to tag fish at different levels in the food web um, and, and predators at different levels in the food web. And that would, they would be a great target species. Um, and I, actually, there's a, a the Biologging Floor Symposium that's coming up in March in Tasmania. We're involved in a workshop where we're going to be talking about tag miniaturization and how we might do these types of things. But certainly arrays and acoustic tagging would be a good, a good way to do that. Thank you, George. Is there any comment or question over there. No. Uh, a question. This kind, kind of program are, uh, have a cost very, very high, I think. Uh, do you have some experience uh, with uh, uh, initiative like adopt a turtle and follow them through your web page? Uh, something like that to reach today donors. Yes, okay, so may I show one more slide? Um, I'm just going to, I, I was, I might as well just show you this really quickly. Um, this was what we did with the, one of the beauties of the tracking work is it really helps, um, I think, the general public get a window on, the, on what's happening in the ocean. And because of the charismatic nature of these species, um, they draw a lot of attention. And if this works, maybe it's not going to work. Shoot. Well. Sorry, um, but I'll, so these these were the turtles in the Great Turtle Race, and we found it, different sponsors, corporations, foundations, nonprofits, and schools to underwrite the cost of a tag, and it pro also provide a premium for conservation on the nesting beach. So, um, and then when we ran the Great Turtle Race, and this is just one example, we also found a, an American comedian named Stephen Colbert, who is who we named the turtle after. And, that attracted a lot of attention because he featured it on several of his television shows. But as a result, within 10 days, we had over 700,000 unique users visit the website we created, which had a lot of educational information on um, conservation and, and the status of leatherbacks and management of marine habitats and tracking data and oceanography. And we, um, over this period, we had you know, 700,000 unique users, 3.5 million page views. and. Uh, 70,000 people from all over the world signed on to learn more about sea turtles. So we provided content. When there were some lessons learned, we, the site was sticky. We, we set it up so that it would update every 10 minutes. And that wasn't actually initially the, the plan. It was just sort of something we happened along. We were, and we found that people were texting in from all over the world and coming back to the website to see how the turtles were doing. And they've developed emotional attachments to different individuals, and we created cards with information, with baseball cards, we call them, for the different turtles. Okay, thank you, George. Okay, thank you.